Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of trekking through compliance. His mission? To explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Trekking Through Compliance, Episode 65, Plato's Stepchildren. In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we consider the episode Plato's Stepchildren, which aired on November 22, 1968, and occurred on Stardate 5784.0. Story synopsis. When the Enterprise diverts to answer a medical emergency on an unknown planet, its crew discovers a great group of natives of the star Sandara who claim to have traveled to Earth during the time of Plato and Socrates after their star Supernovae. When Greek civilization died, they left and settled on the current planet, which they call Platonius. The Platonians have a very long lifespan but are easily injured. They are also sadistic psychokinetics who amuse themselves by manipulating the dwarf, Alexander the dwarf. McCoy attempts to treat a minor cut on their philosopher king, Parman, who which he has sustained and has become massively infected. However, Parman has a high fever and begins to become delirious. Unfortunately, his delirium translates into moving, shaking, and breaking of objects, including up on the Enterprise, which is in orbit above the planet. Fortunately, McCoy hypos Parman, and the psychokinetic fit ends. When Parman comes to, Parman and the other Platonians begin to make life miserable for Kirk, McCoy, and Spock in order to convince McCoy to stay behind and act as their personal physician. Parman first makes Kirk slap himself in the face repeatedly and then makes Kirk and Spock sing and perform silly songs for them. He also makes Spock laugh. When McCoy begs Parman not to continue forcing Spock to laugh, Parman makes him cry hysterically. In a final insult, Kirk acts as a whinnying horse while Alexander rides on his back. Spock and Kirk question Alexander and find that the Platonian's power developed six months, 14 days after their arrival. On the planet, Spock surmises that a substance in the planet's food, which is responsible for their mental powers, since the Platonians began consuming native foods after consuming their two to three month supply of food they brought with them. The chemical curanide is found to work in conjunction with the pituitary growth hormone, explaining why the dwarf Alexander is unaffected. The Platonians force Uhura and Nurse Chapel to beam down for their further amusement. They force Spock to serenade Chapel and Kirk to kiss Uhura. Kirk and Spock are forced to take a hot poker and whip and pretend to use them on the women. Alexander tries to stab Parman but is discovered and forced to turn the knife on himself. However, Kirk gives the Platonians a taste of their own medicine when he stops Alexander by using the psychokinetic power he has acquired using a curanide injection given to him by McCoy. Mind games between Parman and Kirk reveal Kirk to have the stronger power, and Parman backs down and promises to behave in the future. Kirk takes Alexander with him, leaving the Platonians to their own devices and warning that he can recreate the psychokinetic power if it should be needed. So what is the fun fact from today's episode? Well, unfortunately, it's really not a fun fact, but it's certainly commentary. This episode is most well known for the first interracial kiss on television. However, when re watching this, it became clear that it really wasn't a kiss intended by the Platonians. It was a rape, which they wanted to watch. Um, such an approach of thinking about this as the first interracial kiss fails to consider the context of the kiss. Uh, as I said, it's really now seen as a rape, uh, which the Platonians were going to amuse themselves by. It's quite difficult to watch. Yet, for another perspective, a uh, link, uh, link in the show notes to missionlog.com, which embeds an interview with Nichelle Nichols about the filming of the scene. So I would suggest you check this out. So what are the compliance takeaways from this? Well, um, we have to start with uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Here we have men and women allegedly dedicated to the ideals of Plato, and yet uh, all they wanted to do was watch others engage in activities for their own self-abusement, all the way from humiliation to physical uh, attacks to torture to, indeed, uh, the ra- aforementioned rape that I discussed. So uh, it really leads to uh, thinking about uh, your uh, CEO uh, we've had some really interesting commentary over the past week about the sociopathic CEO 
and what that means for your organization. Um, and that really leads to uh, another point I'd like you to consider. What happens when senior management is in on the illegal conduct? Obviously, from the FCPA perspective, we have the Cognizant Technologies case, which uh, where we had C-suite involvement in the bribery scheme. Uh, we've seen that in the past with other companies uh, as well. And uh, Panasonic Avionics had C-suite involvement in the bribery scheme. And what allows or why does a CEO think that they can get away with this uh, literally when the entire company knows about it, uh, even if they try to hide it? So that really leads to point three, and it's internal controls. So that's why you have internal controls, obviously to prevent misconduct, but also to detect misconduct. And this was important for the both Panasonic Avionics perspective and in Cognizant Technologies. In Panasonic Avionics, you had um, the CEO with a unfettered discretionary fund of $10 million, which he, he used to pay bribes. But in Cognizant Technologies, you finally had uh, the bribery scheme, which once again was centered in the C-suite, um, with uh, C-suite members now under individual indictment for their roles in the bribery scheme. You had internal controls pick this up and it reported to the board of directors who then turned around and reported it to the Department of Justice when two weeks of notice. And this led to uh, Cognizant Technologies getting a full declination. This was a, a very significant case. Uh, it really stunned a lot of us in the compliance community because we had thought if you had C-suite involvement, you could not get a declination. But Brian Benchkowski and others and in the um, criminal division of the Department of Justice have made clear that if you respond robustly, and here uh, Cognizant Technologies responded as robustly as one can, uh, you can potentially uh, receive a declination. So that's a, a huge issue for every compliance practitioner to understand going forward. I hope you'll join us tomorrow on Trekking Through Compliance when we take up the episode in the wink of an eye. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. 